Uh, good evening, and everybody, and welcome to Inside the Avatar Studio. Uh, the purpose of this particular session, as we've had a number of these in the past, is to bring together innovative leaders from virtual technology to discuss their uh, per perceptions, perspectives, and predictions of what being virtual means in today's society. Uh, today's guest with me here is Buyer Sellers, Robert, uh, Robert Bloomfield. Uh, Robert is a professor with Cornell University, the Johnson Graduate School of Management. Over the past four years, Robert has been an advocate for the serious uses of virtual worlds for education and distance collaboration. His extensive experience includes the use of simulation software to study effects of regulatory policy, investor welfare, and financial market behaviors. Uh, Robert's virtual world activities have been covered ex extensively in the media from Business Week and the New York Times to CFO Magazine and Technology Review. Currently, Robert is the host and editor-in-chief of the weekly Metanomics event series in Second Life, as I'm sure everybody is aware here, in addition to serving on the editorial boards of peer review journals, including the Accounting Review, the Journal of Accounting and Economics, and the Journal of Accounting Research. Robert, welcome. All right, thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for being here. This is this is. Uh, you know, we'd, we've been talking on and off for the last couple of years, and it's 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 going to be kind of interesting to to actually have you you over here for a change. We get to actually have one of these conversations in, in a bit more of a public forum this time around. Yeah. Um, the the topic that we were looking at today is this idea of the the first twenty five hundred days of Second Life. Um, you know, at this. point, at this particular point in time, and it's sort of a takeoff on Kevin Kelly's idea of the first 5,000 days of the internet. Um, and we're looking at, in, in general, we're looking at sort of what benefits have come out of the last 2,500 days, right? Because really when you, when you look at uh, a lot of information that Kevin Kelly and others have, have talked about in terms of the first 5,000 days of the internet, there, there really was this tipping point or this, this point at which the, the web sort of coalesced from being this thing that nobody really understood to this thing that became ubiquitous inside our lives. And yet the first 2,500 days of this virtualization, which we call Second Life, does or doesn't necessarily appear to be going that same direction. And I know through your conversations with a lot of very influential speakers over over the last couple of years of running Metanomics, I'd really like to get your your take in terms of what you've seen over the last you know five, six, seven years that you've been looking at these virtual spaces. Yeah, well, you know, I think the first thing that that I'd point out is uh, there's such a difference between the internet uh, and and Second Life. Uh, the first one being that that Second Life is a single, you know, it, it's run by a single company. Uh, now they they bring uh, users in, you know, user generated content is is obviously a huge thing here, but it's within the guidelines that Linden Lab sets and within the uh, you know, compared to the internet, the restricted technology that that Linden Lab allows people to use. So when I, you know, I mean, I think uh, it, it's also instructive just to think about where the internet was uh, 2,500 days ago. You know, so what has changed outside of Second Life uh, in the last 2,500 days, and then compare that to how Second Life itself and its community has changed. And, there, you know, I think there's no comparison. Entire companies have come and gone. Uh, hardware has come out, you know, 2,500 20, days ago. I mean, I've got, I've got a droid uh, now, a, a droid phone uh, in my hand that, you know, does, <laughs> you know, it's just... It, unimaginable 2,500 days ago uh, that you could have a phone that does all the things that this does. So, uh, you know, I guess that's, that's sort of the first thing that occurs to me is, uh, you know, what I don't see in the virtual world community is the, the kind of cross-company innovation uh, that, that you're seeing in, in the larger Internet. 
Well, that's that's kind of interesting because I mean the uh, and and again there were there were three things that Kevin Kelly sort of pointed to in terms of what he was sort of expecting to see over the next five thousand days, and to a certain extent it would it would seem as if we should be able to take advantage of a lot of these benefits now. The first one was this idea of embodiment, the idea of of an Internet of Things, and that we wouldn't actually, like similar to the the computer, ne not necessarily having a hard drive, that you would, your, your computer, your mobile device, your Android phone, whatever it is that you're working with from a technology standpoint, would just simply touch the cloud, right? It would, it would go, it would just sort of stroke it, <laughs> type of thing. <laughs> hmm, I'm wondering where you're going with this embodiment <laughs> and stroking. Well, no, no, not, not in those particular areas. But I mean, and, and this idea, the second idea was this idea of restructuring in terms of the semantic web and access to information at all levels. And then the third being this idea of codependence that we, we as being plugged into this become extensions of, this, of, of the machine uh, almost. And to a certain extent, it would, it would seem as if those capabilities are all, they're, they're sort of all here, but they're sort of not. And, you know, when you're talking about having an Android phone and, and it not, you know, it, you know, seven years ago, you know, not even being able to contemplate having something like this at, at your beck and call. I mean, it just, it, it very much seems, I guess, to a certain extent, it, almost as if we're missing the boat on something. That there's, there's something missing from what we're doing with inside a virtual context. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'd say if you look at the changes that we have seen, um, and and the changes that that Kevin Kelly is anticipating, I mean, I think it's worth asking: Are those things that strengthen the? Uh, so, so you know, you've got the supply and the demand issue, and so I, you know, I, I guess I would ask two questions when I look at at the the recent and projected evolution of the web, uh, you know, just of, of the, te the internet technology itself. Um, one is, is it making it more possible to do the things that, that Second Life and Virtual Worlds promise? Uh, and I think the answer to that is, is yes, in some ways. Um, but but the more difficult challenge for virtual worlds, I think, is on the demand side. Does it reduce uh, or increase the the desire that that consumers uh, and producers have to uh, to you know develop a virtual world presence? And and I think there the the answer is uh, you know more more pessimistic for virtual worlds because uh, you know if you look, I mean, I I think back to when I had a chance at the SLCC in um, in Tampa, so that must have been 2008. Um, I had a chance to interview Philip Rosedale about. Uh, okay, wait, where were we? Bevan is saying 2009. So where were we before Tampa? Uh, before uh, Tampa would have been Chicago. Okay, now now I'm just I. Oh, okay, now Bevan says I'm right. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, but it, anyway, so the, um, it, you know, I, I had a chance to interview him and ask him sort of how he saw uh, the technological changes getting, uh, you know, what, what was helping and what was hurting Second Life. And, and his big point was that they were really, and again, you know, so this is the summer of 08. Uh, and back then he was saying, well, we were really caught off guard by the rise of the laptop computer that we have been designing Second Life to run on PCs. It's very, uh, you know, right, bandwidth and processor intensive. And, and, you know, it was a setback for them that now they've got people who have uh, off-the-shelf laptops that, uh, you know, struggle on both the bandwidth and the processing and maybe, you know, don't have the option for a plug-in graphics card. Um, now, you know, now I look over at my desk at my Droid phone 
And I say, you know, I mean, this is just, I think, gotten more and more uh, of a challenge for, for Linden Lab and Second Life and, and, and for the idea of virtual worlds and immersion in general, because how do you immerse yourself in a three by five or whatever this is, you know, th three by four screen? Wow. That, uh, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, it, it's, it, it's interesting because, I mean, it, 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 it sort of goes into something that I was going to talk about a bit later, but I, was, I, I might as well bring it up now. I mean, there, there was a conversation I had, and for the life of me, I wish I could remember the person that I had this conversation with, but they were talking about this, this concept that 20-somethings today are not looking at virtualization the same way we're looking at virtualization. I mean, we're, we're sitting here, we're in Second Life, we're, you know, our avatar is a bunch of pixels. And, you know, everybody looks good and all this other, other type of stuff. But the, the way the 20-something the crowd is, is looking at their quote-unquote avatar is more of an abstract, abstract concept. And you know, where the technology sort of fits their view. It's almost as if they're creating uh, their avatar is essentially a brand that they're wrapping around themselves. And the brand is independent of the technology. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so, I mean, whether you can run Second Life on an Android or on an iPhone or on an iPad, to a certain extent, doesn't necessarily make a lot of, a lot of difference because that's not where the the new generation that's sort of coming through high school and university that's not necessarily where they're necessarily seeing themselves and how they're immersed with inside a virtual environment they're seeing themselves as, as in, in a much more abstract concept and I, I guess you know to a certain extent I'd like to get some of your opinion about that that particular aspect of, of maybe where that may be leading us from you know, from an economic standpoint and from an innovation standpoint. I mean, does, mm -hmm. does the ability to run Second Life on an Android phone even have any meaning if five years from now the bulk of the way we're going to look at ourselves is more, more of a brand rather than an avatar? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I, I'd put this, I mean, to go, to go back to terms I... Uh, learned very early on in, in my days in Second Life. You know, we had the whole immersionist, augmentationist uh, distinction where the, uh, you know, I, I think what's happened is it's become much more difficult to be an immersionist. I mean, and that's when I talk about, you know, well, what am I going to do with a three-inch screen? It's going to be very hard to immerse myself in in this, uh, you know, in a visual world with uh, game-like physics and, and all of that. Um, but the augmentationist side, you know, where I, where I just view Second Life as a way to, to do more stuff and, and with different people, uh, you know, I, and I'm, I've always been an unabashed augmentationist that for me, Second Life is just one more thing that I, Rob Bloomfield, do as opposed to, uh, you know, creating buyers, sellers and thinking of actually having a, uh, you know, sort of in, in, in infusing my identity into an avatar uh, and immersing myself in it. Um, and, and it just, that it sounds to me like, that, like you're describing young people as being augmentationists. I think it's been uh, the same technologies that make it harder to be an immersionist make it much more easy to be an augmentationist because now, you know, and I know my kids, they're, you know, uh, well, well I, I have one kid who's, you know, very big on Facebook and he texts, you know, texts his friends, uh, you know, 20 times an hour or whatever. And, uh, you know, he's very, he's got his virtual community, but it's not a visual community. It's not distinct from his own identity. And really what he wants to do is just... Um, you know, get these little touches with people. He just wants to get these little, uh, you know, these opportunities to, uh, you know, to interact with someone who otherwise he couldn't interact with, which I think really uh, is a huge part of, of 
you know, the, if you're not a content creator in Second Life, it's all about the people. It's all about the community, uh, you know, building communities, drifting from one to another, uh, finding, you know, uh, striking up conversations with unusual people that you never would think you would have met. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's just, it's, it's a very, very different, uh, uh, you know, I think the kids, again, the kids are augmentationists. I don't think they're looking to immerse themselves. You know, the other thing, of course, is, you know, but I think most of the people in this audience are, are my age-ish, and, and you know what, they've, uh, these young kids, they have the bodies we all build our avatars to be, so, you know, <laughs> they're immersed in, in, in something else. Oh, goodness, yeah, to have the body that I have in Second Life, that would be, that would be nice. The, um, to a certain extent, then, do you see, you know, if, if you compare what, you, what your view of what was promised back in 2006, because, I mean, you've been in Second Life about as long as I have. I mean, we're, we're you know, getting into the four or five years inside this, this environment here. If you look at the promise, or, or what the, the anticipated promise of Second Life was, you know, five, six years ago, compared to where we are right now, how do you, how do you see there being, you know, the, the, the difference between where we were compared to where we are right now? Um... You know, it, it, okay. So I, I would, I would say that Second Life has predictably, uh, you know, was was predictably underperformed what we all expected. Uh, which, which is, as an economist, I should point out, is a is a contradiction because if we expected it, how could we? you know, predict that it would underperform. Uh, and I'll just, you know, let me just trot out a couple uh, terms from, uh, from uh, psychology. One of them is, uh, you know, the planning fallacy is one. Um, motivated reasoning is another one. So the planning fallacy, and we all experience this all the time, is someone says, how long is it going to take you to get something done? Uh, and, you know, if, if they're asking you, you know, here I have something you need to do right now, sit down and do it, you can be reasonably accurate. But if it's, uh, if it's how long is it going to take you to redo that website or debug this code or, you know, write that dissertation or whatever, everyone is always way, way overconfident and they, uh, they overpromise and underdeliver. Uh, so that's the planning fallacy, and it's predictable because, you know, we even believe ourselves when we say, oh, I can get that done in two weeks, I can get that done in a year, uh, even though we shouldn't because consistently people are wrong. So that's the planning fallacy. Motivated reasoning is uh, is the tendency that people have to grab onto every little bit of information that will help them believe what they want to believe. And so just uh, to pick an example that's been in the news a lot, Sarah Palin. Uh, there's been a lot of news about Sarah Palin uh, floating around over the last few weeks. And what that tends to do is, uh, you know, the people who didn't like her grasp onto the stuff that they don't like about her and they uh, like her less. Uh, but the ones who did like her, they ignore the stuff that might be against her, uh, you know, that might, you know, make them change their mind. They grasp onto the stuff that makes her look better and they, you know, and everyone's reinterpreting everything to make them themselves, uh, you know, to be able to justify what they want to believe. And so when I think about what Second Life has done, I, I think really it's pretty, uh, it's not surprising that Linden Lab made promises uh, that, that were hard for them to keep about improving the technology. Uh, I think it's not surprising that all of us in the community uh, were overly optimistic not only about what Linden Lab could do, but also over optimistic about uh, all of the other types of um, 
you know all of the other technologies i mean i we had on on metanomics we had we had mitch caper who you know was talking about the various you know 3d cameras that were going to do this and that and capture your expressions and allow you to fly and you know i mean you know by moving by gesturing with your body uh, and you know, I mean, it's not. I, I'm not saying these these aren't going to pan out, but they certainly didn't pan out as quickly as we uh, were all motivated to hope. So, you know, I, I, another thing that I guess I'd like to emphasize, because I, I, you know, I don't want to make this all. I I feel like I'm sounding very pessimistic, but uh, I think it's just it's very important to to think about Linden Lab as one company and to remember how change occurs. And the the bulk of business innovation is not does not come from a company who says, oh now we're going to uh, you know, now we're going to to come up with something totally new and different and reinvent the world. Usually what it is is a new company with uh, a uh, technology that's so new that it's not really compatible with the existing technology. They come in, they are the game changer, and you have what uh, Joseph Schumpeter, the uh, Austrian economist, called creative destruction, uh, which uh, is very, re if anyone who knows it from Marxist theory, totally different thing. Uh, this is really just the idea that you know, it's it's the the new companies coming in, the new ideas and new tech technologies coming in, and really destroying the old. And so you get this leapfrogging. Um, and so, I mean, I if you if you look back at my interviews with the, I, I interviewed most of the top people at Linden Lab on Metanomics in fall of '07 and. Uh, and spring of 08, and I would always ask them about this leapfrogging issue. You know, is is Second Life going to be the, you know, Linden Lab going to be the company that's going to take this to the next level and really have it break out, or is it going to be some company we don't know about that is going to overtake them? You know, and so, uh, you know, and I've been looking at the companies that have come out and none of them really, you know, I mean, Linden Lab is still number one, which I guess is good for Linden Lab in the virtual world space. But I think it's uh, it's a sign that the the virtual world sub industry is not, uh, you know, is not thriving and is is not as promising as it seemed in two thousand and seven, two thousand and eight. Yeah, there's there's a lot of interesting things that you've mentioned, and I'm just I'm I'm furiously writing down notes here as we're going along because there's just you know every time I get a chance to talk to you, I mean, there's just so much interesting. You know, yeah. things can, that come can, out of the conversation. Can, can, can I, I? I see Mistress Amira Resident, if I'm pronouncing that right, asked a question. Uh, what about Morpeg companies? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that that that's a good question. And uh, so, so the game companies, um, you know, when I the, so this is Morpeg, you know, the mo massively multiplayer online role-playing games, and and you know, I think it's 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 great that they have such a long uh, acronym that no one quite knows what to do with. Uh, but but a point that I would make, and you know, I'd want to break that apart uh, in, into. Uh, in, into really three pieces. So first you have the massively multiplayer online. And I think that aspect of the Morpeg technology has hugely, hugely taken off. Uh, and, and, you know, you just look at, at you know, whether it's the light social games uh, like Farmville or whatever, don't kill me just for naming it, uh, or or what you know, the, or your Facebook and uh, you know Facebook and texting and all of this stuff. I'd say that you know that's the massively multiplayer part where you have all these people interacting, and so that's now I you know I think that's where the internet is now. And I I don't know how many people uh, I'm a very avid reader of blogs and and news sites, and I love. To read the comments, uh, but you know it's gotten to the point where you go to the New York Times and Paul Krugman writes an article, 
and it's got thousands of comments before you can bat an eye, uh, which is, uh, you know, to me a bit, uh, you know, it almost makes me say I'm not even going to bother looking. Um, so, so that's the massively multiplayer online part. And then there are two other parts to that. There's the role-playing part, and there's the game part. And I think, I think those are, you know, so a lot of people in Second Life enjoy the role-playing part, and I think that is the part that, you know, when, when they make fun of Second Life on The Office, or when they make fun of World of Warcraft on South Park or The Simpsons, I think it's actually the role-playing part. That they are uh, that they are making fun of, and and that's the part that that I think is always going to appeal to a more niche audience. Uh, the the idea that you're going to be controlling a character, you're going to be a character that. Uh, that you're not, yeah, okay, so Mistress Amira says uh, South Park made fun of all of it, and of course, that, you know, that's in their job description. So, um, But the game, that the last piece of that MMORPG is, is the game, and, you know, people have always loved games, people are always going to like games, and uh, and I really, you know, that's the part that's always going to take off. And again, that's that's the part, you know, if I, if I have one uh, personal disappointment with Second Life, it's that it's not an easy place. I mean, their technology allows a lot of beautiful graphic creation, uh, and it allows some ability to create games, but not to the extent that, that I'd like to see. I mean, when I think about what uh, what Second Life could do better while not, you know, while going the augmentationist rather than the immersionist route, it would actually be to rejigger the technology so that it would support residents being better able to come in here and create interesting games. Uh, you know, create the back-end databases that are going to yeah. keep track of, of what you need to keep, keep track of in uh, in games and uh, you know, go from there. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 a lot. I mean, from the technology standpoint, I mean, this is something that we've had discussions with other people about as we've gone along, and that the um, you know, it's it's interesting to watch people come into, especially new educators come into this environment, and the very first thing that they do is they bring all the old techniques with them that they used in the physical world, and it takes them anywhere between three and six months before they finally start to get it, that, oh, wait a second, I can do so much more, right? They, they sort of have to get over that, that um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to use the word that everybody hates, but I'm going to use it anyways. They got to sort of get over that paradigm shift in, in terms of understanding the, the potential of the platform. And as you said, with regards to the gaming aspect of it, the ability to have non-role-playing characters in here and the ability to do, uh, and, and just very simple things, right? In, in terms of you know, having an avatar be able to go over and pick up a glass off a table and, and have it appear inside their hand. I mean, that seems so simple if you look at uh, other games, from Xbox and PlayStation and, and Wii and what have you. But in here, it's next to impossible. I mean, we just simply can't do it, right? The technology isn't allowing us to do it. So I understand where you're coming from with regards to that. I want to go back to something which you were talking about before, though. I mean, and, and sort of connecting this idea between what was promised and this idea of creative destruction. And... In, in part, one of, one of the things I'm wondering about is, was not one of, and maybe this is <laughs> my own recollection being a bit fuzzy, but one of the original promised benefits of this that, that I had heard a lot of people talk about, and I, I cannot at this point remember whether or not Philip actually mentioned this or not, was not just in terms of technological change, but also in terms of social change that the the nature of what was happening with Inside Second Life was going to, at, you know, at the risk of, of using a euphemism, which is probably not exactly correct, but, I mean, it, it was essentially going to create this, this panacea where borders really were meaningless, right, where we had a currency that would be worldwide, 
right, that we would have this um, opportunity to to do things without and you know to a certain extent without government regulation, without oversight, without uh, you know being able to create almost a utopian type quote unquote society, and <laughs> it'd be called the yuan. Yeah, the it and it would be interesting to a certain extent because what we've seen especially over the last year is really that's that's not at all what things have turned out to be right second life has not become a ubiquitous platform across the internet although it is free and open um you know it's 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 really not that platform that i think a lot of people in the early days were sort of expecting it to be from a from a social change perspective um, and I mean, I know you were talking a couple of weeks ago when you were talking with Dusan about this idea of, um, with regards to equilibrium assumptions in terms of aggregate outcomes and individual behaviors, uh, being two of the major assumptions when you start talking about accounting and economic models, right? So, and it's also two of the things that you also mentioned at the time were two of the hardest things to try to model also with inside those particular uh, those particular environments, uh, to a certain extent, how do you how do you see the the way in which social change has either benefited or maybe come back a fair bit from where we were, you know, five five six seven years ago? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, if you're talking specifically about Second Life, I think you know, I think so social change is just limited by, uh, by, you know, the number of people you have and the ways that they can interact and, you know, and, and how really how, you know, let's just think about networks. Um, you know, it's how many nodes do you have and how many connections do they have and how quickly can they restructure their connections. And, and I think, you know, Second Life is all the other things that I've talked about limit Second Life's ability to be a real engine for social change just because there aren't, you know, they, they limit the number of people, the number of nodes. Um, and, uh, you know, anyone who wants to complain about uh, groups, you know, the number of groups you can have and the difficulty of keeping track of everyone and, you know, the difficulty of searching out businesses and finding live events and all that. I mean, all, all of those are things that reduce the number of connections that we can make. So, uh, you know, I, I think that now if you look outside Second Life, if you look at social media, I actually, you know, I, 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 I am less uh, confident that it's a good thing, but I'm pretty confident that there actually has been a lot of social change. And there's going to be a lot of social change that is driven by the advent of, you know, very active blogs with lots of comments um, you know, Google has been incredible in allowing people to just, uh, you know, type in natural language in, uh, into a search window and find a community where you can comment on their website. Uh, and then you add in uh, Twitter and Plurk, and you're seeing, you know, lots and lots of uh, connections being made. And, and, you know, if we want to talk about social change, I mean, you know, again, this is played up a lot in the media, but you can think about things like, uh, you know, the, the uh, almost revolution in Iran. Uh, I know people have been talking about Tunisia and the role of the internet there and, you know, people trying to find proxy servers and, and all of that. So, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, can the web create some types of social change? Yes. Uh, where, how is Linden Lab and Second Life doing it? Not so well because they don't have the nodes and they don't have the the ways for people to make connections. Uh, and you know, and is it all for the better? I'm I'm not so sure. You know, there's a lot of research that's going on now looking at. Uh, people's view web viewing habits, and it you know it turns out that for the most part, uh, just looking at politics in the U.S., uh, Democrats you know right you know people uh, who are liberal go to liberal sites, and you know uh, people who are conservative go to conservative sites. They're finding one another. Uh, it's arguably polarizing more. Uh, 
you know, good or bad, I, yeah, oh, what, what do I say? I report, you decide. <laughs> yeah, I guess in, in, in part I was, because it, it's interesting, you know, a lot of the examples that you were, you were citing really, you know, they're, they're outside of Second Life. And although we have web on a prim here, I mean, it's still a lot of those connections, the ones that seem to be more important. And not to take away the, the personal connections that uh, people develop with inside this virtual context, but um, we still haven't quite hit, it seems, the quote-unquote killer app that sort of bridges virtualization or virtual worlds with these other social phenomena that are occurring outside of 3D virtualization, 3D virtual worlds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, you know, hold on, let me find, there's this great article uh, by F Train, I don't know, it's called uh, The Web is a Customer Service Medium by Paul Ford, let me Paste this yeah, actually, Bevan in. just sent me a copy of that earlier. Yeah, I was looking so at that. Here, I'm pasting on this here. into local chat. And I'd just be interested in, uh, you know, those of you in the audience, if you've seen this already, just type a plus one. Uh, I, and Because I think it's, it's really, this guy has a very useful way of thinking about media. Uh, and he says, you know, he, he has this subsection called the fundamental question of the web. And he says, I, let me just I, uh, read a tiny bit of this. Um, you know, he says, you can define a medium in terms of how it looks, what it transmits, wavelengths, typographic choices, bandwidth. I like to think about media in terms of questions answered. Here's one question. I'm bored and I want to get out of the house and have an experience, possibly involving elves or bombs. Where do I go? And the answer is you could go to a movie. Uh, how do I distract myself without leaving the house? You might turn on the TV. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm driving or making dinner, but I want to make it more interesting. What should I do? Well, you know, radio, especially talk radio. Um, and then, and, and so the question that he asks is, what is the question to which the answer is the Internet? Uh, and so he he comes up with this little question, which is, why wasn't I consulted? Which is uh, WWIC. Uh, so I, I expect we're all going to see this a lot. Uh, and, you know, why wasn't I consulted? It really gets to the heart of, I believe, why a lot of us find um, find social media and the user-generated content aspect of Second Life so appealing is that it gives, you know, hell, it gives me a chance to be a talk show host and ask questions the way I think they should be answered and direct the conversation <laughs> that I, you know, that I want to hear. Um, and, you know, we can all, uh, in Second Life, we don't just have to complain about how, uh, you know, some hosting company is doing something, if that's how you want to think of Linden Lab. You know, we can actually get in and say, you know what, I think Sims should look like this, and we make them. And I see people are, you know, uh, Kiki uh, Walpenheim is saying personal podcast, and, you know, you see lots of people doing that, or they're creating YouTube, and it's all about, uh, all about wanting to believe that we are... Uh, I guess psychologists uh, talk about efficacy, self-efficacy, uh, that you want to believe that you can actually change the world in some way, you have control over your environment, and, uh, and especially if you're a guy, you have control over other people's environments, <laughs> uh, you know, so, so I, you know, again, the question, you know, we can think about this as the as the the a larger issue for the web, um, but now if we turn this to Second Life, and you know, I, I guess I should have thought about the answer to this question before, uh, or, or really, you know, thought about the question. You know, to what <laughs> to what question is Second Life or a similar virtual world the answer? And you know, is the question. Uh, I want to dress up as or be surrounded by uh, beautiful women. 
is it is it I want to be able to create a world, uh, you know, that is that is my world using my imagination? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I think, uh, you know, as I say, I should have thought about that uh, before before we started talking. Yeah, I guess. Well, to a certain extent, I mean, you you could always go somewhere along the lines of you know my my imagination and no limits. I mean, that's certainly you know one area where where this environment tends to excel. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's interesting though because I mean one of one of the things that we've seen over the last year and and sort of related to this is I think a a disconnect between policies that Linden Lab has been putting in place over the last year and it it almost seems as if they have been systematically deconstructing almost every every piece of what I would consider to be their competitive advantage. Um, and, and specifically over the last year, year and a half. Um, and it, it really is, it is really related to this question in terms of why wasn't I consulted? I mean, one of the, the strongest things that has bound the community here was the fact that they were consulted. Right, and that Linden had Linden Lab had a very strong connection to the community, and it seems that systematically over the last year or so that they have dismantled that, and to a certain extent, some of the some of the challenges that we're seeing them going through right at the moment are very much a direct result of this. Right, that that because we've become disconnected from the input process, um, we've now got what. Uh, uh, John Lester, a Pathfinder Linden, um, had been talking about recently in terms of this idea of a walled garden. Um, Open Sim has now all of a sudden become a major alternative to to Second Life, and while the value proposition probably isn't exactly there just yet, um, it does represent, to a certain extent, a, f a fracturing of the of the community, um, because if you know, if we can't be consulted within Second Life, then why not go someplace where we can be consulted? And so you look at Reaction Grid, you look at InWorlds, you look at Spot on 3D, you look at Project Wonderland, you look at, you know, if Blue Mars ever gets <laughs> get their stuff back together again. I mean, you look at these other virtual worlds and, you know, they're, they're still got this consultative uh, process in place. Um, and it's the one thing that seems to be yeah, probably Blue Mars is unlikely, but you know, it, it seems to be one of those things that uh, you know we've been trying to get this idea across to Linden Lab that they've been deconstructing the the most crucial part of their competitive advantage, which is really the people. And I mean, you look at you look at Facebook, you look at eBay, you look at Craigslist, you look at any number of these social phenomenon, and the, the social network is really part of the production process. And that's part of what brings these, these people together. Um, and so I guess to, to, to a certain extent, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, from an economic architecture standpoint, I mean, have, have we in fact dismantled too much of what really has made spe uh, Second Life special? In, in terms of in terms of where we're at, yeah, I, you know, it's a good question, and you know, so of course, L Linden Lab. Okay, let, actually, let's take the example of Craigslist. I mean, I think right, Craigslist exists entirely to allow people to find one another to you know trade whatever goods and services they have in mind. Um, the technology is very straightforward, and it's it's really a network effect, uh, a, a a positive feedback loop more than anything else that makes something like uh, like Craigslist work. The idea, uh, and this is a really common one in in markets of any kind, that. Uh, you know, everyone wants to go where everyone else is going. And so you know Craigslist is out there, and so if you have a small-scale product or service uh, that you're trying to buy or sell, you know that if you go to Craigslist, other people are thinking the same thing, and so you'll find your transactional partner there. Um, 
so so I think you know when I when I look at what Second Life has to get right, I mean I think the the first thing is uh, you know I mean they have to have something uh, you know people are not coming into Second Life to transact with one another. And so the question is really, you know, what are they trying to do? Uh, I, I, you know, the first question, and here I agree with you, is, you know, are they trying to interact with the world or are they trying to interact with other people? And I think it's, uh, you know, I think it, well, really it's both. I mean, I'd say it's mostly the people, but they want to interact with the people in the world. Uh, that's presumably why are, they are here rather than somewhere else. And so... Um, you know, but then the question, you know, you're asking, well, what are their, their policy decisions? I don't, you know, I wonder how much of what they're doing is really policy mistake as opposed to just trying to deal with the technological problems um, that, that, that they're up against. I mean, I, I remember having a talk with, uh, I think this was Ja Uri, uh, uh, a couple years ago, he actually came to Ithaca and we had a chance to to talk in person um, and he was talking he was telling me about you know the the difficulties of just the mathematics of the group chat and how you know how costly would it be to add one more group to everyone and at what point do they have to completely change their uh, their architecture. So it's not so much, you know, I think a lot of these things are not so much policy issues uh, as they are, um, you know, technological challenges, even where they agree, where everyone agrees on what the goal is, which is to, you know, be able to do more interesting things in the world with more uh, people. Um, the yeah, so I, I'm, you know, the other thing that, you know, where they have laid down policy is really more on what, what I'd call the regulatory front, where they, you know, or the, or the policing and enforcement front, where they're saying uh, you can't gamble if you're going to uh, engage in explicit uh, activities, you're going to do it in specific locations, uh, and you can't run a bank. Uh, you know, those are those are really the three biggies that that I've seen since I came into Second Life. And and I, you know, there's no question that big communities built up around all three of those, and they've all been uh, harmed. You know, the communities have been. Uh, thwarted in their desire to do what they wanted to do uh, by by Linden Lab, and uh, you know the the right uh, you know you can ask questions about whether those were wise for the larger community, and and there you know I understand Linden Lab's reasoning well, on all three of those, but yeah. but boy you know that's I I don't think that's the you know. Well, I mean, to to be to to be fair, I mean, on on the banking side of things, I mean, anybody that that went through the two thousand six two thousand seven you know quote unquote banking crisis, you know, where banks were were popping up, they take people's money, and then all of a sudden they disappear, and there was no accountability. Right. I mean, there's, right. Right. There's, and so, so the you know, I mean, I think I think that the. You know, so that's the argument in favor, and you know, of the of the banking ban. The argument in favor of the gambling ban is that uh, you know that that it was illegal, and that Linden Lab suffered the risk of uh, you know of legal action uh, in the U.S. and the you know the uh, what's the oh and the, and the sex you know the idea was that well there are all these people who aren't coming into second life because they're worried uh, you know the the you know there's sort of this taint on on the entire world and you know and I think those are all reasonable uh, but but they all went directly uh, you know very very so a couple things I mean one is they went very very contrary to the libertarian ethos that um, 
that that Linden Lab had promised. So when you ask, you know, you asked before about sort of, you know, to what extent did Linden Lab and Second Life fulfill its early promise? I think one of those early promises was an extremely libertarian view, and and you can you can be in favor of libertarianism or not. I'm I'm not a huge fan in the real world, um, but uh, but I think I think. I think that that it would have if if Second Life really wanted to have a niche and and I saw someone I missed who this was earlier someone said Second Life well, I'm just scrolling through the chat Second Life will never survive until they reincorporate in Sealand which I believe if my memory serves is like a an old uh uh oil rig in the, the middle of the North Sea that is uh, free of jurisdiction. <laughs> and so you can, you know, they could allow people to do whatever they want. And, and I think there's actually something to that. I mean, if you really want to think your world, your imagination, that means that if you run a bank and, you know, I see, I see there's some bankers defending themselves here uh, and, uh, you know, uh, investors who still have their money. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's reasonable to say, um, you know, your world, your imagination, your risk. Uh, you know, anyone yeah. who put their money into one of these Second Life banks and couldn't predict that they weren't going to get their uh, several hundred percent interest rate uh, you know, back, I, you know, that was pretty silly. I, I was studying all those things because it, you know, because basically the, uh, and actually a anyone who's interested, if you, uh, if you Google uh, Bloomfield and uh, unregulated stock markets in Second Life, I think you'll find my SSRN page where you can download a, a recent paper that, uh, that is coming out in the Southern Economic Journal on uh, SL CapEx, one of the stock markets in Second Life. Uh, y you know, you look at this and you say, this violates everything. You know, these markets violate the most fundamental uh, beliefs about rational economic theory and financial markets. And it's really a very simple issue. Uh, these markets provide no investor protection, and therefore, uh, what standard economic theory says is they should have no investors. No one should be willing to give their money to to an anonymous person. Uh, with you know, on you know, I don't even want to call it a contract or a security. Basically, you give the issuer money, they claim, you know, they state that they are going to keep you informed about their business and pay you something back. Yeah, but isn't um, isn't this to a certain extent, though, where you were talking with Deucin a couple of weeks ago when, when you were talking about individual behavior and that people are not necessarily rational? I mean, the, the fundamental yeah. assumption in economics is that people make decisions, quote-unquote, on the margin, the margin being, you know, whatever feels right at that particular point yeah. in time. Right. And so, you know, somebody comes up to you and says, hey, you know, give us a whole pile of money and we'll give you 60 percent interest. Right. Yeah. With inside a gaming environment, it sounds like a good deal. Well, you know, I mean, and right, one of the questions we can't answer in this paper uh, is, is why exactly are investors giving money to issuers in the absence of any sort of legal or regulatory investor protection? And one answer to that is, well, it's a game, for God's sake. Couldn't you figure that out? Um, <laughs> You know, uh, yeah. and maybe that's what's going on. But I think I think it's actually uh, I, I think it's different. I th I think that you know individuals. And let me you know now I actually just had a debate with someone over this, so I'm gonna I, I'm gonna make you all live through this. You know my view on this as well. But you know you have to. Okay, so economic theory assumes that you can look at markets especially financial markets but lots of other markets as if everyone is rational um, 
And that as if is really important. And I think what's happened with economists is that they have uh, they have forgotten that we're only you know theorizing as if everyone's rational and instead they start thinking well everyone is individually rational and that's just you know anyone uh, anyone who has a kid or a boss or a spouse uh, knows that individuals are not rational uh, none of us are uh, but what does happen in market settings is that uh, competition and other economic forces will drive prices to reasonable levels and will protect people uh, in, in lots of very clever ways. And people build institutions to protect themselves or, or people will, you know, get an insurer uh, you know, they'll get insurance and rely on the insurer who has a lot of money at stake to try to deal with this. Mm. Um, and so, so and anyway, you know, the point, you're getting back to the bigger point. I think that, that, you know, Second Life, one of their promises was to be a libertarian playground. And they did it for a while, and I thought what they did was fascinating. It was it was interesting uh, to watch the gambling and the games that people created, and it was fascinating for me uh, personally and professionally to watch uh, to, to watch what was going on uh, with the um, uh, you know with the markets. Uh, to, you know, to me, and and I, I'm sad that we lost that. Although you're right, we probably protected a lot of people. You know, we probably kept a lot of people from losing their money. Um, you know, so so going back to the original question about Linden Labs policies, I mean, maybe they need to be a lot more gutsy and forward and say, look, uh, Linden dollars are not real money. Uh, if people are exchanging this, you know, we're going to try to figure out how to set things up in here so that we can have legal gambling and we can have, you know, legal stock markets and we are going to let people do what they want. And uh, we're going to see a lot more creative destruction. Hmm. We, we have a, uh, only, a, only a couple of minutes before we sort of have to go off the air in terms of the the recorded portion but obviously i i you know i'd like to continue the conversation even beyond once the the broadcast portion is done just in in a couple of minutes um i'm wondering if you can maybe give us some idea in terms of what you see sort of the next 2500 days sort of looking <laughs> looking like and i i realize for, that's for a very big life? question well, it, virtual worlds in general, because I think when we start talking about this, we're not just talking about Second Life, but we're also talking about the what Second Life has ended up spawning in terms of, um, you know, it, it, it's very easy to criticize when somebody has been creative, right? Because it's sort of like, ah, pff, I can do that, but it's the creative effort itself that is, that is really the hard thing to do. And it's always easy to criticize after the fact. So we've gone through, you know, seven years, 2,500 days of Second Life. And now we get to look forward to the next 2,500 days. But we know it's not just Second Life. We also know it's Open Sim. It's going to be whatever the successor to Blue Mars is. It's going to be Unity 3D. It's going to be Project Wonderland. It's going to be all these, you know, Cobalt and all these other different things that are out there that are now yep. playing in the same space that Second Life is. So... Where do, where do you sort of see the next, you know, five, five to seven years sort of going? Um, yeah, and of course, you know, all I can do is be wrong. Um, you know, my goal is, right, <laughs> if I say 15 things, one of them will pan out. And when I look back at this, I'll say, see, I was right. Uh, that's the motivated reasoning I was talking about uh, uh, before. But, no, let's see. I, so... You know, you you mentioned the other technologies, and and I think that is just that's really where, if we're going to try to see where this is all going, we need to be thinking about the other technologies because uh, I just you know uh, technologies ossify, and they you know th think about right now if Second Life said we're going to make a major change and instead of 
prims, we're going to have prums, and they work a different way, um, you know, and you can leave your prim stuff up for a little while, but, you know, as of December 31, 2011, everything's going to be replaced, and, uh, you know, right, th it isn't just the technology that's going to keep Linden Lab and Second Life from making the major changes it needs to uh, to really go to the next level. Um, so I, you know, I think I think leapfrogging is in it is the future of of uh, user generated content oriented virtual worlds. I got I hate to think what that uh, what that acronym is like. <laughs> um, so. Uh, so so let's look at the other technologies and uh, you know open sim so open sim suffers from the technological restrictions i mean i know it's you know it's not second life exactly but it's uh you know Right, it's it's similar enough that they're going to, you know, that they've ossified, and it's going to be hard to make major changes. Uh, I think Unity seems much more flexible and much more promising, uh, much more adaptable to different media, and and I know that some very good people are working with it now. So, you know, I think what I'd say is is uh, you know. I mean, if I were to look at virtual worlds and the immersive aspect and user generate, well, actually, I have no idea. Can you actually, you know, maybe someone in the audience knows this better. Maybe you can't actually do uh, user generated content very easily in Unity, and so so someone's going to have to take the idea of user generated content and build it in a completely different framework. And that's really, I think, where we are going to see uh, the big the big advance. Um, you know, there, there are other things that seemed, uh, you know, I just don't know, uh, you know, what one of the, probably one of the most exciting technological advances that, uh, in my mind that, that really seems to be coming mainstream is, uh, you know, motion detector style, uh, you know, right. We had the Wii, uh, the motion detector controllers. So the Wii, you hold it, you move it around. Uh, now we've got, what's it called, Kinect, uh, uh, Kinect. And there are some others coming out, you know, where, where there's actually a camera on you and you do stuff. I, you know, that's, that's interesting. I don't think it's going to be quite, uh, quite the ticket for Second Life uh, for a while. But, uh, you know, just because of the, because one, the technological uh, hurdles, it still doesn't seem like they're quite there. And two, and, and more important, is that I just don't think they, I, you know, it isn't clear to me that that really answers whatever question it is that is bringing people into Second Life. Excellent. Well, we're we're going to wrap up the on-air portion of Inside the Avatar Studio at this point. And buyers, I invite you to stick around because I'm I, I would actually like to continue the conversation uh, for a little bit after after we go off air. Um, for right at the moment, I would like to uh, very quickly thank yourself for being here with us for the past hour. This has been wonderful well, to have you here. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much to Bevan Whitfield, who's helped pull this together, in addition to uh, Mel Burns and uh, Robertus Hash, who have been helping us with the, the stream to uh, NBC uh, and Metaverse. So, you know, thank you guys. Uh, sorry, MetaWorld. <laughs> thank you guys very much for your, your help and support. And I know we're on a bit of a time deadline for uh, for what you've got there so we'll let you do the the count out at this point and uh, once we're done there then we'll we'll come back and pick up the conversation with buyers